Now moving ahead with the next alumni talk, I would request Dr. Anish Kumar Rimbaseri from NII to join us. Brief introduction about Anish. Dr. Anish completed his master's degree from Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala, and then he moved to CCMB in 2004 and joined Dr. Purnima Bhargava for his PhD work. For his postdoctoral post research, he moved to NIH USA and followed by another postdoc at North Carolina University. Currently, he is principal investigator at NII Delhi. His research focuses on studying nutrient metabolic interaction in multiple organ systems like skeletal muscle, liver, uh, even immune cells, bones, and uh, he uses vitamin D as a model sy system. Also, he is interested in studying how mycobacterium tuberculosis regulates its protein during in infection. Over to you, Dr. Anish. First of all, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's not just a pleasure, it's a huge honor to be here on, a, on the Founders Day and uh, to uh, give a talk. And uh, it's also nice to, uh, you know, talk after Kasturi. Uh, I think Kasturi left NIA, uh, CCMB immediately after I joined. She went to NIH. As soon as I think I reached NIH, she left NIH. <laughs> so, so we had this relay going on. Uh, finally, we are here again together. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, since. Um, I was told that it's, it has to be about the journey as a, as a scientist, uh, from especially from CCMP, uh, how the career has progressed or, or what was the journey that was talked about. So I thought finally, initially I'll just talk about the physical journey, you know, from where to where I hoped. Uh, then we'll come back to the other part. So I'm from Kerala. I did my master's in Mahatma Gandhi University in Kotem. And um, in the final year of my master's, I got selected at CCMP in 2004. Uh, so I came here. I worked with, uh, I joined Dr. Purnima's lab, and where we worked on a CERVCA, RNA polymerase 3 transcription, and chroma, how chromatin regulates that. Uh, from there, I jumped to, oops, uh, NIH. So where I did two completely unrelated projects at the same time uh, in the NIH Dr. Richard Maria's lab. One was in SRVC only, RNA polymerase 3 termination, how polymerase terminates the trans transcription, the bi biochemistry of that. And uh, another one was in SPOMB, which is a fission yeast, how tRNA modifications are regulated. <coughs> so from there, <coughs> I I moved, actually within the U.S. I moved, the last six months, I moved to another place in uh, NC State, North Carolina State University, uh, to learn something about stem cells and organoids. Uh, by then I got an offer from NIA, and I joined NIA where I am studying now vitamin D and energy metabolism. So that jump is quite a bit drastic. Uh, so there is a big story behind that. We will come to that. <laughs> so. Uh, so one of the, when I, when I was applying, when I was doing my master's or when I was applying for PhD positions, one of the, uh, I mean, even before that, I always wanted to be a scientist. That was my, you know, uh, that was my fixed goal, to be a scientist from probably school days. So this was a normal progression for me. And of course, to coming to CCMB was like dream, you know, to, to, to come. And, Actually, it lived up to the name, you know, as a, as a bachelor's or an MSc student, it was a dream. And once you come here, it is exactly like that. You have, you know, everything here, you know, it's pretty cool. <coughs> but again, when we talk about journey, right, so there's another journey which is very, very relevant in the, in the entire process. That was my first trip to CCMB to attend the uh, entrance exam. Okay, so I applied here. So the so here the first day was the entrance exam, second day is the interview, then next three days are going to be interaction with the faculty members about the projects. So the thing is that the sixth day I have my exam, final exam in my university. So I didn't book my return ticket. Because if I don't pass the you know exam, I, I can go back the next day. If I pass the exam, don't clear the interview, I can go the next day. So that, that was the idea. But I got selected. Third day, Lalji was a director, so there was a meeting with the director, uh, with all the new students. So he talked, and 
I had to catch a train that day at 12.30. So around 11, uh, 30, um, around 11.30, he was ready to take us to see all the facilities. Then I you know, said, I have to go now. So he was a bit taken aback, I could see, but uh, then I said, I have to, uh, if I don't go and uh, attend the exam, I won't be able to come back again. So he actually smiled and he was very cool. He said, okay, you go. So immediately go, take the bag from the security, go, take auto, go to Secondary Bus Station. The train was on the first platform. And it was Sabri Express, so it's easy to spot. It was, you know, Sabri Mala season, so, you know, it's very, if you have seen the train, you know. It's very easy to spot. It is on the first platform. So I knew I have no time to go and get the ticket. So I jumped in the general compartment without ticket. <laughs> and then, uh, till Gundur I had to stand. It was packed, jam packed. Till Gundur I had to stand. At Gundur I got a seat in the general compartment. And somewhere in the middle of, you know, when the train stopped for some time, I went out and got a ticket. So that's my first trip to so a very, very memorable trip. I even traveled without ticket. But a side effect of that was, since I didn't go and meet with any faculty members, I didn't know about anybody. Right, so I didn't meet anybody. Only thing I have was that I had was a booklet. A booklet of uh, all the projects each of the faculty members have given about their project. That, that's the only thing I have. Well, there is internet, but there is no website for each faculty. So I had to go to a cafe, look at all the uh, you know, publications and all, and then, you know, I have to make a call. And, you know, it's very, nobody has been here. I didn't know anybody from CCB at that time. So that's when, yeah. This one. Uh, so, so this was actually the project. I mean, this is basically the crux of the project that Purnima had given at that time. Uh, so, what I understood at that time was that, you know, there are two, there is a promoter element, okay? Uh, that's a two element promoter, which is bound by a single transcription factor, but it is too far apart. So she had previously shown that there is a nucleosome sitting in between them and bringing them together. So I thought, yeah, this is really cool. I mean, you know, it's pretty nice. And the idea is that how is it happening in vivo? That was basically the pro project proposal. So I felt that's incredibly cool. I wrote an email to her, you know, I, I couldn't meet you, so I want to join. And she was fine, so that's why I gave her the as the first option. So then I came to lab and then learned more about RNA polymerase 3. Uh, so a little bit of background. So polymerase 3 transcribes tRNA genes. U6 as an RNA gene, 5 as an RNA genes, and, and a small non coding RNA genes like that. And its promoter structure is peculiar. Intracellular promoter, there are two uh, boxes called A box and B box. Both are occupied by the transcription factor called TF3C. And that brings TF3B upstream, which in turn recruits polymerase and do the transcription. But in case of yeast, U6 as an RNA gene, these are too far apart. So, there is an uh, in vitro at least at that time we knew that there is a nucleosome sitting here that is enabling it to bind and bring the transcription. So we did a bunch of experiments, uh, uh, footprinting assays and uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation assays and figured that yeah, this should have come later actually. Yeah, uh, there is a new indeed there is a nucleosome here, but we also found there is a nucleosome upstream and. When you repress the transcription, okay, by, by nutrients, starve, starve the cells of nutrients, what happens is this nucleosome moves to cover this data box region, disengaging this polymerase, not the promoter. So that's what actually we finally discovered, and this doesn't really move. And there are a lot of other involvement of other chromatin remodelers and uh, modifications and histone chaperones involved in this whole process. That was a discovery. Now, I wanted to show this, I'm not going to describe this, uh, the reason is, I mean, I was going through these papers, you know, last week to prepare for this. Then only I realized, you know, actually looking at these gels, we actually figured out this mechanism. It was like, you know, more like an abstract painting. You just stare at it long enough, you will get some meaning. So exactly that's how most of the <laughs> biochemistry works. So uh, yeah, this was my how I did my. PhD, and <clears throat> yeah, of course, and it was really 
a fun place. SMB was a very fun place. Uh, we had a very enthusiastic batch uh, 2004. Uh, I mean, we have done a lot of fun activities, fun stuff, a uh, lot of nonsense stuff. But uh, but we also had uh, quite a bit of uh, scientific activities, like you know, um, on Mondays, Monday night at around nine o'clock, we will meet in committee room number two, outside the lecture hall, and talk about work. Means each day one person present about their work. And I know many other batches in CCMB were doing it at that time, in different, different ways. So we were also doing something similar. Uh, so that actually helped a lot. Because you are sitting, you know, somebody like me who is very uh, difficult to ask questions in a general, uh, you know, talk. Uh, you know, your friends are talking about rosophila genetics, your friends are talking about uh, cell biology and stuff like that. Uh, you know, you can actually have a pretty interesting interaction there. And that helped a lot. That increased the, uh, for most of us, that actually has helped a, a lot. And of course, the lab was also pretty uh, interesting. I think so. Anubhav is still here. I, I don't think anybody else is here at this point. Uh, and we used to go out quite a lot, especially with external uh, some visitors are there. But uh, after here, I moved to NIH. So um, to Richard Maria's lab. So his lab was like, again, you know, he, he doesn't care what you work on. He works on large number of things. RNA polymerase three transcription in yeast. He works on uh, RNA processing, RNA modification, mRNA stability, ton of stuff. I mean, thing is, he has to get interested. That's it. Excited. That's it. Uh, and it was quite an interesting experience for me and he was very generous, very open to anything that I wanted to do. Uh, so in, since I had the poll 3 background, the first question that, uh, that, that I took upon was uh, a very simple question. How does RNA polymerase 3 terminate and why is it interesting? Because <clears throat> RNA polymerase 3 has a very simple terminator, just a stretch of T residues on the non-template. That, that, that stretch is good enough for it to terminate. So uh, there is no other, and you don't need any other factors to do that. And you also de don't need any RNA secondary structure for that. So there is no RNA polymerase that can do that. that, that, that that's, and why is such an interesting aspect? Because an RNA polymerase elongation complex, whether it is bacterial RNA polymerase, pole 2, pole 3, or any other RNA polymerase, their elongation complexes are extremely stable because they're built not to let go. So if you take them, put them in fridge for a week, still it will function, active, functionally active. You, uh, you, know, you wash them with one molar sodium chloride, still it will not let go. It will, the complex will be intact. But the moment in case of pole 3, uh, all of this is true, but the moment it comes to this terminator, it just releases on its own. So what actually makes that? That, that was the question that, uh, that we were trying to address. And of course, the, the, at that time, the, the, the major hypothesis was it is the instability, the, the inherent instability of RUDA hybrid that is somehow making pole 3 release it. Other RNA polymerase is not affected by that. <coughs> Um, yeah. So again, my, I'm not going to go through this. These are the kind of gels that we had. So we are trying to stare at it and try to figure out what does all these things, in vitro transcription, all these results mean. Finally, what we figured out was that, yes, indeed, two things. Yes, indeed, the RNA-DNA hybrid stability matters. That actually, if you have a long enough, if you have a nine nucleotide RUDA hybrid, that is enough. That means the whole hybrid is in. Uh, RUDA hybrid, then, then it releases the transcript. That's fine. But that's not the case in most of the cases, most of the terminators. So the most striking part of our finding was that the non-template strand plays a role. So if you ask most of the people in the transcription field, non-template strand is basically an afterthought. Nobody cares about it. Because it doesn't really go into the polymerase, it doesn't really, it's just out there. Crystal structure doesn't have its structure, you know, no, nothing. So nobody cares about it. But apparently it looks like the third and fourth T's of the non-template strand interacts with a particular protein complex of the pole 3 to make it unstable. It actually f forms a pre-termination complex and the fifth T releases it. 
transfer. So that's basically the, uh, the, the findings that we had. <coughs> uh, so then there was another project that we have been working on. That's another, uh, the, the, that's, a, that's a paradox. So this was my, mostly my problem. I was actually getting interested in specific questions and we want to answer those questions. So there was a specific problem associated with in RNA processing or tRNA biology in, in, in the field from 1990s. From the time they discovered MAF1, which is a repressor for RNA polymerase 3. So if you kill this protein, RNA polymerase 3 activity is pretty high. You have a lot of tRNA there. So you should have more tRNA, more tRNA, that's the idea. So then in Pombe and Cervicia, there is a particular color system. Okay, we have a mutation, a uh, uh, stop codon, premature stop codon in the adenine biosynthetic pathway gene. If that stop codon is there, its substrate accumulates and you have red color colonies. Now if you give a tRNA, suppress a tRNA which can read through that, that, product, that uh, protein will be made, it will be converted to white color colony. This is simple as it. So ideally if you have more tRNA, uh, the suppressor tRNA, you should have more white colonies. So, but in Pombe and Cervici, multiple labs have shown that it doesn't happen. It actually becomes more red. That means you have more tRNA but you have less activity. So this is a pretty interesting problem for me. So ultimately, what we found was that <coughs> it's a simple biochemistry problem of enzyme availability and the substrate abundance. So when, the, when you don't have MAF1, you have this particular tRNA modification enzyme called TRIM1, that becomes limiting. But you have tons of tRNA there, so it gets diluted out. And, and the, the suppressed tRNA doesn't get modified, it becomes inactive. So that is why we are, that paradox that we have. So we used um, a lot of genomics for the, to, to come to this, identifying tRNA modifications through genomics, through, through RNA-seq. That was uh, when I actually started, in, you know, getting interest in genomics. And by the end of it, I, when I was looking for jobs, so this was a bigger problem for me. So I always wanted to do basic research, you know, only, you know, that the kind of research that we initially started, that was my super basic, that kind of. But by the time I'm done with this, I really didn't want to be stopped exciting. This, those kind of problems stopped exciting me. So I wanted to actually have something else. And at that stage, those who are in job hunting, you know that it's actually quite difficult to propose something entirely different and, and to get a job. So that is a very, very, very difficult situation at that time. So that's why I moved for six months to Raleigh to study the, the uh, stem cells. So we actually, you know, I did help somebody set up a lab to develop organoids, cerebral organoids. They were coming at, a, at that, that time. So that I can actually use that system in my new lab or when I get a job in my lab, I have experience, so I can propose that. So I did that, uh, but the, that's how I came to an II. Uh, but certain things, uh, you know, uh, due to some reasons, ultimately I ended up asking an entirely different question. Okay? The question now that we are focusing is, how different malnutrition paradigms, especially right now focusing on vitamin D deficiency, how that affects uh, muscle function, metabolism, and regeneration, especially from a point of view of uh, energy allocation. So I will I'll tell why how, how I mean it's I know it's pretty pretty drastic jump, but it didn't happen in one year. It actually happened. Now I am saying this. I could not have said this in four year back or, or three year back even. Uh, so I will tell you about that, but this is right now we are focused on. So why is it important? Because uh, energy allocation programs are actually something that really drives our uh, health. Like, see, when you are sleeping or when you are taking rest, your muscles do not really need energy. They are actually at the resting state. They really don't use energy at all. But your brain, your visceral organ, your liver, pancreas, those are still functioning. They need to keep functioning. So body has a mechanism to prioritize. So to be honest, muscle is actually one of the least priority. Because even in, in severely undernourished people, uh, what happens is that 
energy outflows from muscle and adipocytes. So they are taken away from muscle and adipocytes. As a result, muscle shrinks. That's why when you starve, your muscles shrink or uh, your fat depots get depleted. And other organs are supported by that. So that's why if an extremely malnourished uh, individual, you may have higher BMI. Your body weight goes down, but your visceral organs are still keeping up. But if that goes down, then that means the person is in a very critical stage. So body has to maintain that energy balance, so that's the whole purpose of it. So there are different kinds of molecules. In short term, insulin and glucagon are some of the molecules. In the long term, catecholamines, some of them work in the short term as well. Uh, corticosteroids, thyroid hormone, many of them actually functions in this energy allocation where energy should be prioritized. So in energy and protein malnutrition, it is pretty well known. But uh, so what we, are, uh, we started asking was, what is the role of micronutrients in this? That is still we don't know. So, especially vitamin D in the energy allocation program of the, uh, the animal. So, now coming to the, 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 the journey where I got that point. So, uh, we have done a bunch of things. So, it came with something around stem cells, but some things happened, didn't really pan out. But by, during my, this whole journey, I had really picked up bioinformatics, genomics aspects. So that actually helped us to collaborate with a lot of people and get some publications going on. And that also helped us to get involved during the COVID time in SACOC sequencing, wastewater surveillance, that kind of aspects also we do. So that, that one, that's one aspect of the lab. But more than that, the, at, the, at the scientific project level, so we had three distinct things we are going on. One is Mycobacterium tuberculosis protein synthesis, that was with Vinay. Um, then with uh, Satyajit Rad, we had uh, immune cell metabolism. So, uh, so that's also going on. I will not talk about at this point. And another one was vitamin D and muscle. And this is particularly important here because another CCMB alumnus, Suchitra, who actually made this happen. Uh, she was Josna's student. Uh, so, she and me overlapped at NI for a short period of time, so we both got interested in this, a little why. Uh, so that's how this project started going, and it actually went, took me to, you know, almost like chasing a white rabbit. Took me to completely new, new, new paths, which I had no idea about. So some of it I'll tell. So why we started doing this? So we had a VDR knockout mouse. VDR, vitamin D is a steroid hormone. It actually binds to VDR, which is a nuclear receptor. So, so we had a VDR knockout mouse. So that is actually shows all the phenotypes that people with mutations in vitamin D receptor show, uh, severe osteomalacia, growth retardation, and severe muscle wasting. So muscle wasting, because of my interest in protein synthesis, muscle wasting became important because most of the muscle mass is by protein. So that's how we actually started looking at this from an entirely different point of view. <coughs> uh, I'll just skip through this. Why, you know, most of the body weight is muscle, uh, so muscle affects the metabolism. And how exactly muscle affects the metabolism? So there are two functions, two primary functions. One is amino acid metabolism. So once we have food, uh, from the intestine, you have amino acid flux into the bloodstream. The blood amino acid level goes up. And you have insulin, high insulin levels uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the blood. Uh, that activates protein synthesis in muscle and protein degradation is inhibited. Now, in the post-absorptive phase between meals, okay, what happens is insulin goes down, amino acid flux goes down, so serum amino acid levels started going down. and you have increased protein degradation, which actually release amino acids into uh, release amino acids into the bloodstream, so that liver can take it up and make plasma proteins. Now, in case of energy imbalance, what happens is muscle stores a lot of glycogen, and that can be converted to lactate. That can be used by liver for gluconeogenesis. Muscle, though it stores glycogen, it cannot release glucose into the bloodstream. It can also it also start degrading proteins, sending out amino acids, gluconeogenic amino acids, so that body can make uh, proteins, uh, glucose. Liver can make glucose. 
uh, that's why. So ultimately what we had shown, so this was the question that we are asking, why there is a muscle wasting phenotype here. So this is a model that we have. <coughs> What we really found was that there is a glycogen storage disorder. That means these muscles have increased glycogen synthase, which converts glucose to glycogen and, and store. But they cannot really convert this glycogen back to glucose. So that process is going on. So as a result, you have energy depletion, which activates, uh, which downregulates mTOR1 and activates MPK, which leads to muscle wasting. Second effect of that is you have increased GLUT1 expression. GLUT1 is a high affinity transporter for glucose. So it takes up a lot more glucose now. Now muscle is hungry, it starts taking a lot more glucose, ultimately depleting glucose in the bloodstream and creating a systemic energy deprivation. So okay, I'll just finish in five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> so th that is interesting. So. One interesting aspect of this mice is that when they are with their mother in the weaning state, pre-weaning state, they don't have any problem. I mean, they, they are perfectly fine. There is no muscle problem. So then once you start weaning them, they start showing the phenotype. And that is true even if you delay weaning. Only after weaning they start. So then you know, we started asking questions, why is that? Apparently milk is a very high fat diet. So then we started arguing that probably, you know, it cannot use glucose. But muscle's advantage is that it can use glucose and fatty acid equally well. So maybe, you know, here high milk, you know, fat content is actually rescuing or inhibiting muscle loss. Uh, so basically we sat with these research diets and actually designed a custom diet, uh, and which is based on milk, actually mouse milk. And they completely rescue the mouse just by giving a high fat diet. Uh, the, the body weight, muscle weight, everything is rescued. So we had this hypothesis. Now glucose utilization is going down, but you have now fatty acid is standing in for that. The, then finally, we asked if that is true, any fat should work. That was the idea. So we started giving a regular high fat diet, which is you know lard based. There also we see energy of body weight restoration, but we don't really see muscle weight restoration. So again, there is a quality difference in the fat. Um, so and also we see there is a problem with, in that particular diet, there is a problem with the glucose clearance. So this is you inject glucose and measure the glucose at different time points. At what time point glucose completely gets cleared. So in, in milk-based diet, if you give, they get cleared as good as wild type, but here, it gets delayed, the clearance gets delayed. So this is a classic symptom of either insulin resistance or insulin, absence of insulin. So after a lot of uh, brainstorming, we started looking at insulin, and this is what we started finding. Uh, VDR null has no very low levels of insulin. But if you give a milk-based diet, that completely restores insulin secretion. But the other high fat diet that we have, that has very low, insulin response is there, but very low level. Now, so indicate that probably what is the problem? Is it a production, insulin production or secretion? So there is definitely a problem with secretion. So if you look at insulin levels in the eyelids, you can see this particular diet when we give, only VDR has a problem in insulin levels itself. So now, the th so what is the meaning of this indicates that in two other diet types, okay, either a carbohydrate-based diet or a milk-based diet, in both cases, insulin synthesis is happening normally. But the moment a part so we don't know exactly what the material, the, the components are, but this particular high-fat diet, that condition, vitamin D becomes essential for insulin synthesis itself. I mean, we think it's insulin synthesis based on a couple of other data as well. Uh, so yeah, so this is actually something the new direction that we have. Uh, that's why it's like chasing a white rabbit. We start seeing this kind of observations, now we have to go behind that. We have to collaborate with somebody to figure out what is happening in the pantreas. Uh, so finally, some of the questions that we are trying to address are, why there is a glycogen storage disorder in the first place? What are the functions of vitamin D in different metabolic conditions? And so the idea is that in a lean person versus a obese person, whether the requirement of vitamin D more than that, the function of vitamin D. Both are doing the same, in both individuals, whether vitamin D is doing the same function. 
That is the kind of question that we are asking. And finally, how this is something we are starting now, how uh, muscle regen regeneration is affected. And finally, I, I'll just skip this part. Okay. Finally, thanks to the lab for, you know, it's a very exciting place to be uh, with all the students. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people, all these difficulties, all these transitions would not have been po pro possible without the help of a lot of people. Uh, some of them too, you know, the ne Anamika did most of the work, Neha did the pancreas work. Suchitra, she is the one who actually brought us into muscle, taught us how to deal with muscle or, or even identify muscles. And uh, Vinay was always there uh, to, to support. Uh, Satyajit was also there to support in the, uh, when he was at NII. Uh, then collaborators, Veena, Anna, Deb and Pushkar. Uh, and the funding agencies, funded by SERB, DBT, and mostly by NIA. I'll stop here now. Thank you, Dr. Anish. Uh, we are open for questions now. That was really an informative talk, and we are open for questions now. At the back, I can see some hand raised. Yes. Yeah. Anish, uh, really very, very interesting work. So I think obvious question okay. which I have is, you might have thought as well. So how do you see the vitamin D levels in diabetic people? Is there any? Vitamin D? Vitamin D levels in type 2 diabetes or whether? Okay, so that's a very, very confusing field. Actually, um, multiple people have tried, you know, the systematic reviews have come, which actually shows that there is not much of a difference in terms of level. So now, type 2 diabetes per se, there is nothing, some studies say that there is a correlation, some doesn't say that there is a correlation. Now, uh, there is some kind of a negative correlation with obesity. But that is normally considered as, because it's a fat soluble vitamin, and the body's fat content is high, you know, that kind of act as a sink. So that is what is known. But the functional differences of vitamin D uh, in obese or in, in, in type 2 diabetes versus a, you, know, uh, you know, lean and healthy individual, that's not really known. Most of the studies are vitamin D levels are there or not. That, that, that's what it looks. It doesn't really look at whether it has entirely, we actually have some implication, it has entirely different function in an different metabolic settings. Hey, Vinay, you want to go? I'll go after that. Vinay, you want to go? Okay. So the question that you particularly, you specified that this is uh, mouse milk based diet. Uh -huh. Did you say that? Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I did say that. So the question obviously is, uh, I mean, did you try other milk, commercial no, no, no. So milk? Or? The original, so this, is, this was the way it actually evolved. Okay. Because the mice, the pups were with mice. Uh, with mother, so they were having, you know, and, and there are differences between in the composition of milk between different species. Uh, that also we know. So that's why we decided, okay, if whatever is available in the literature about mouse milk, let's go and 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 design it based on that. Okay. So, yeah. but then later you switch to regular milk. Yeah. So we have other, another milk-based diet also that also helps. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Hello. Uh, interesting finding. Uh, actually, I uh, missed the initial part of uh, your discussion, but whatever I understood, you said that milk-based diet actually uh, improved the uh, insulin production uh, in the last third slide, right? And uh, in your high-fat diet, you could not see that uh, the insulin production was not taking, uh, taking place, right? So what if uh, you try to... Uh, uh, add uh, external vit vitamin D in high fat uh, diet and just uh, see that whether insulin levels are restored or not in order to connect it with the insulin production and the function of vitamin D. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, okay, to answer that question, directly answer that question, this is a vitamin D receptor knockout mouse. Yeah, so, yeah. they actually have higher level of vitamin D. Yes. Because of a feedback mechanism, actually the body senses low calcium and low uh, vitamin D. It actually makes a lot more vitamin D. So their vitamin D levels are actually high, but it cannot function because VDR is not there. Correct. That's that's one thing. So uh, and 
Second thing is that it is not, the, the high fat diet is not restoring it completely, but the complete energy profile of the muscles are coming back up. ATP levels go up, mitochondrial activity goes up, uh, muscle, um, uh, all the pathways. Uh, so muscle energy levels are completely restored. Just muscle mass is not getting restored. That is because of the insulin problem. Yes. Yeah, so I couldn't get into the details of that uh, due to time, but th that's actually is happening. So the original hypothesis was to, if you can give, uh, like vitamin D is required to decide whether muscle can use carbohydrate or fat. Yes. That, that is true actually. But in the body, it's not just muscle as a isolated system. So, you know, problems with other organ systems also comes into play. That is why we have a problem here. Thank you. Hi Anish, uh, did you check the levels of uh, leptin or ghrelin or has anyone reported? Uh, no, leptin, yeah. so that's a very good question. Uh, so we have, uh, our current hypothesis is that they, they may have high levels of leptin. So there are some indications of that. Uh, so we haven't really looked into that. So that's an interesting aspect that we are actually trying to look into, how it is actually affecting the uh, feeding behavior itself. So there are some clues are there, uh, but we have to do that experiment yet. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anish. I would request Dr. Vinay Nandikuri to come on stage and present memento to Dr. Anish. Thank you, Dr. Vinay. Thank you, Dr. Anish.